Thank you everyone for coming um, to our uh, special diabetes, um, our special Department of Epidemiology um, seminar. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Rich. Um, the, uh, Dr. Rich is the director of the Center for Public Health Genomics at the University of Virginia. Um, but I'll just, I'll end there because I, I think almost everybody knows Steve Rich because uh, he seems to have collaborated with everyone at some point in the past. Um, I've worked with him on type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. Um, our dean, John Salmon, has worked with him with asthma. There's just a lot of uh, collaborations um, that he's really been a part of. And, and I think that limiting him to one disease is probably a disservice, but we only have an hour. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've enjoyed working with him, and I know that a number of you have worked with him, and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say, um, because he's really part of the, one of the leading groups looking into the genetics of type 1 diabetes, and um, it's a very exciting time. I have to use this. Thank you, Jill. Um, it was sometimes hard to uh, decide what to put in a talk. You know, you're coming to um, the site where probably one of the, the most important foci of research is type 1 diabetes. Um, so for what it's worth, I'll tell you a little bit about what has happened uh, in our work in type 1 diabetes and has been published. But the majority of what I want to talk about is what's ongoing. And like in science anyways, you know, it's what's ongoing that's really in your brain. Uh, and what's past is something you have to remember what you did. Uh, and it's oftentimes um, embarrassing when you can't remember what you did. So the fewer <laughs> times you talk about what you did, the better. So this is actually a, a slide I like a lot because it's based on a slide that Mark Atkinson and George Eisenbarth put together. And it's a little bit different because Mark and George uh, basically had this idea that the risk of type 1 diabetes over time is based upon a genetic risk and then all the process of encelitis and prediabetes until you get clinical diabetes. And the genetic risk was right at the beginning and never shown again. And I don't think it's that way at all. You know, it, I think there are initiation genes that initiate, help you initiate the susceptibility to type 1 diabetes. But there's also islet autoimmunity genes that may or may not overlap with the initiation. And then there's progression genes, those genes that either rapidly progress to type 1 diabetes or slowly progress or maybe even regress. And then once you have type 1 diabetes, we know there are also genes that affect the risk of complications. Uh, and in fact, the, the, so far for what we know, the, the, the complication genes are totally different than those that are thought to be susceptibility genes. So what we really want to do is try to figure out the different site types of genes and maybe the overlaps. So you all know the epidemiology of type 1 diabetes. I won't go into that very much in depth, but it's an autoimmune process, at least in kids. Um, we don't know what exactly is going on in adults with type 1 diabetes. Uh, we think it's probably the same general type of pathogenesis, but that's not clear. You, you know, I was telling some of the students today that that used to be called juvenile onset diabetes, and that was because everyone was studying kids who had type 1 diabetes by the age of 16, which turned out to be because that's where they got the samples from in pediatrics clinics, and that as you actually extended the search for individuals with type 1 diabetes, you find out that individuals in our study in Minnesota, we had people who had onset in the 60s with clearly uh, type 1 diabetes. So at any onset age, pretty much, uh, it was always thought to be non-Hispanic white disease, but in fact, that's not true either. Uh, I think the study and search has shown that um, where it is in, in whites, uh, the actual populations with the highest historic prevalence is not increasing as much as the populations with the lower historic prevalence. So the most rapidly increasing uh, populations with type 1 diabetes turn out to be African and Hispanic ancestry. Uh, obviously, there's high rates in Finland, but according to Michael Knipp, those rates are leveling off. 
And so there's a whole series of interesting epidemiologic questions about what's going on, what are the factors there that uh, affect the rates of type 1 diabetes. Uh, unlike some autoimmune diseases like lupus, there's no real difference in sex in type 1 diabetes in kids. Uh, the age of onset is maybe a year earlier or so in, uh, uh, in girls than, than boys, but you know, it's, it's certainly typical age of onset peaks around 12, 13 years of age. The genetic epidemiology is that MZ twin concordance is about 40%. Uh, DZ twin concordance is about 8%. That's also about the risk to a, a unaffected sibling uh, of a person with type 1 diabetes. The, uh, there's apparently difference between uh, parental transmission. So the risk of, at least historically, it seemed like there's a risk for type 1 diabetes in a uh, mother with type 1 is actually much less than a father with type 1. And that had basically no idea what's going on there. And they still don't know what's going on, if it's true. Uh, obviously, HLA is a major risk factor for type 1 diabetes. And I've been trying to run away from HLA for the last 20 or 30 years, but it still is there. Uh, and we'll deal with it eventually. So I, a lot of the work uh, that we've been doing is based upon the Type 1 Diabetes Genetics Consortium. Uh, I led this effort uh, funded through the JDRF and the NIDDK some years ago. It had a steering committee, which was uh, multinational, Pat Concanon, Henry Ehrlich, uh, Cecile Julier, Grant Morahan, Jorn Nerup, and Fleming Passiat. Uh, Bino Kolkar is the project officer from NIDDK, included John Todd. Marie Neris was a project officer from JDRF. Uh, Joan Hilner was my uh, project leader who went home every day with a headache because she's trying to track all the samples, all the recruitment, deal with all the QC, and I just had to deal with the NIDDK and various other people to try to get more money. Uh, it, was a, it was a good project. We uh, ascertained about 2,800 affected SIDPAIR families from across the world. Uh, generated lots of data, and as you can see from this little button here, every time we had data, we made it available for people to analyze. So this was the first major consortium effort where we had consents for genetic studies and widespread data sharing, and this was all, all you had to do to get data was press a button, file a request, and the data would be generated and sent to you. Uh, one example uh, was that someone published a paper before we did. Uh, but to us, that was uh, an example for NIDK, why it worked and why we should get more money. Uh, so, you know, turn lemons into lemonade. So a lot of the, the materials that we have accumulated over the years in, from this uh, Type 1 Diabetes Genetics Consortium, again, if anyone in China, U.S., uh, France, Spain, or other in countries wanted to get involved, all they had to do is click one of these flags and the whole information would come up in their language. Um, it, was, it was fun. Uh, of course, as with anything, we performed genome-wide association scans, uh, and we identified about four, over 40 loci in the genome that affected risk of type 1 diabetes. This just gives you an idea. The Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium had type 1 diabetes as one of the seven diseases that it, that it assayed. Uh, with about 2,000 cases, and of course there are shared controls, about 3,000 controls, uh, from the NIDDK, CDC, GoKind, and NIMH controls, we added another, you know, 1,600 cases, 1,700 controls, and then our own studies added another 4,000 cases and 4,000 controls. So overall, the combined meta-analyses that was published in 2009 uh, by our group had about 16,000 individuals, 7,500 cases, 9,000 controls. That was a good size of a population back in those days um, for a complex, relatively rare disease. And from that, we were identifying a large number of loci. So this just gives you an idea of, from that paper, uh, in this genetic era, what were the loci identified? Well, HLA had an odds ratio around six and a half to seven. So it is a major contributor. We think that probably HLA accounts for about half of the genetic risk of type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is about half genetic. So HLA alone accounts for about half of the overall risk. Uh, also, insulin gene polymorphism, the VNTR, was known. And this was back in the 70s, even. Uh, 
between 1970 and 2000, those were basically the only two loci identified for risk of type 1 diabetes. With the uh, onset of a uh, uh, you know, non-synonymous SNP scan that was prepared, uh, found PTPN22 and CTLA4 and IFI H1. So three additional loci identified. Uh, PTPN22 and CTLA4 as well as HLA are all autoimmune type of loci, so that makes sense. Uh, insulin, of course, this is type 1 diabetes, you, you destroy the pancreatic islet, so you're, you have problems with your insulins and, and glucose homeostasis. IFHI, IFIH1 is a helicase. That's interesting because the fact that a helicase, thank you, is one type of gene where it is involved in innate immunity. And so you think about the response to a foreign peptide coming in and whether it has a chance to proliferate and actually attack an organ. The Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, this is the 2007, 2008, and they found a few more loci, and then this is our type 1 diabetes genetics consortium. So what happens, of course, is as you gain population size, you can find more things of smaller effect. And we found a lot of things of smaller effect. The other point about this is if you look, you know, there's HLA, insulin, PTPM22, IL2RA, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, Editors like to say, you find these SNPs, so what's the gene? And it's like, I don't know. Of course you know. So what's the nearest gene? Okay, so to convince editors, you put the nearest gene for the most associated SNP, knowing in your heart of hearts that it's not the right gene. But you have to do it anyway. So how do you actually find the most associated gene, actually, or the, remember, these are GWAS results. And so there's like 600, 700,000 SNPs that are assayed out of the gazillion SNPs in the genome. And these are set up because they're in very nicely defined regions. They always give you the right genotypes. They're never in a complicated region. And so how do you actually start doing fine mapping? And for us, we're thinking, okay, we have over 40 regions to be fine mapped. And to fine map maybe takes 1,000 SNPs per region. And at that time, the cost would be, I think, on the order of $1.2 billion for us to do the study in the 25,000 samples. At that point, the NIDDK project officer said, forget it. <laughs> you can't, we're not giving you $1.2 billion. Only she said it with more impact and faster. Uh, <laughs> So we said, well, how can we do something like this? And what happened was at the same time, the type 2 diabetes consortium had found some loci, and they decided to work a deal with Illumina. And the deal was, we'll generate a custom genotyping array if you give us purchase orders for 175,000 samples. Now, type 2 diabetes is 10 times more common than type 1 diabetes. And we couldn't figure out how to get a, a, a purchase order for that many samples, except we realized that rheumatoid arthritis is doing this, lupus is doing this, inflammatory bowel disease is doing this. So knowing that there's a lot of gene content in these regions, we said, do you guys see the same thing? And they said, well, sure. You know, if you look at the genome in every locus, there's actually between zero known genes and 30 known genes. So how are you going to sort that out? You need to have fine mapping. So we develop an immunochip consortium, and basically 12 immunologically related human diseases. Each one of us contributed a certain number of purchase orders, and it turned out that they Illumina decided, okay, fine, we'll cut you a deal. For those members of the immunochip consortium, we'll give you 186,000 custom content SNPs for $35 a sample. If you're not part of the consortium, you have to come to us and we'll have charged $75 a sample. So fine. So we came up with 175,000 samples worth of purchase orders among the consortium. We got our arrays. In our case, we got initially 25,000 uh, samples worth of arrays. And then people would come to us and say, gosh, that's a great thing. I'd love to be part of the immunochip consortium. I said, okay, fine. So Illumina got no one paying $75 a sample. 
uh, that caused a bit of a problem later on because they decided not to redo the immunochip because uh, they weren't making money. But it allowed us to perform a meta-analysis of the first 25,000 samples, and we're now doing all of our samples, which is 65,000. So what I'll show you is first what we've seen on the first 25,000 samples, but I'll show you some preliminary results from the entire mega-analysis of 65,000 samples. So the idea of the fine mapping is that chromosome 20p13 uh, you have a have a association with a SNP, and there turns out to be five genes in that region, and we can't tell which one's important until we plaster that region with about a thousand SNPs, and this is the zoom locus zoom plot of 20p13, and as many of you know, this is a minus log p value, so a 10 is a p value of basically of 10 to the minus 10th for a specific SNP, and this is the most associated SNP. Each one of these SNPs represents analysis or the association analysis related to the 25,000 samples. And as you can see, uh, there's the main part of the significance lines up along SIRPG. And, and that's quite nice because the initial SNP uh, was not that one. The initial SNP, uh, which is listed here, was intronic with effects on enhancer histone marks, EQPLs, DNA binding motifs. But the immunochip analysis, which is this SNP, is actually one that's in high LD with the original SNP, but it also is affecting enhancer histone marks, DNA1 hypersensitive marks, as well as EQPLs and DNA binding motifs. So they both make some sense, but the actual SNP that is most associated is this one. And I'm not certain if I marked where the other one is, but it's somewhere around here. So, this is a way of actually not only saying, now we know where the SNPs lie in which gene, but it actually gives us a better idea of what's the most important SNP that might be there. So when we then looked across all of the SNPs from the immunochip, we utilized the ENCODE project and the roadmap project to look whether the credible SNP list that we devised based on um, sort of a Bayesian analysis of what are the SNPs in a region that's most likely to be involved in risk of type 1 diabetes and put it across all the different types of autoimmune diseases and then looked at the different cell types, we basically looked simply that, okay, well, here's a subset where we have enrichment for our credible SNPs. And it turns out that these are in enhancers uh, and not promoters. And there's only like four genes that have variants that maybe even be in the gene. And furthermore, this tells us that the cell types are immune relevant. So it's CD4 positive T cells, CD8 positive T cells, CD19 positive B cells, and CD34 positive stem cells. So it tells us now for future projects, we don't need to basically look at the entire specific types of regions of the genome. We focus on specific things, and we also focus on specific cell types. So what have we found then over this part of the studies that's been taking, you know, effectively 30-some years, uh, but you can summarize it on one slide, uh, is that we have a credible set of SNPs associated with type 1 diabetes risk. We have annotations from ENCODE and epigenomic roadmap. The fine mapping from immunochip data says that the T1D is most similar to other organ-specific uh, diseases with recognized autoantibodies. It's actually most similar to juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and it's most dissimilar to something like uh, inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease. And the SNPs are located, or at least enriched, in enhancer sequences in active in the thymus, and it's not in promoters, not in genes. So these are the, the cell types that we are really interested in, primarily CD4, CD8s, CD19s. So based on this, uh, you know, we have a few new loci identified because, remember, the immunochip was set up because it had robust GWAS results from 12 autoimmune diseases. Now, one of the things about autoimmune disease is that HLA is important for all these things, but maybe IL-2 is also important for a subset and maybe PTPN22 is important for a subset. So we had this one question 
of uh, a specific gene or a specific locus. And it's like, who, who actually suggested that should be on the immunochip? And we looked back and we couldn't figure it out because there's overlap in autoimmunity for genetic risk loci. And you know, there could be five or 10 people who suggest the same region of the genome important in their specific autoimmune disease. So when you start thinking about the types of risk for autoimmune disease, you can also start thinking about why is it you see families where one person in the family has type 1 diabetes, another person in the family may have Graves' disease, or may have lupus, or it may have rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, some families with two individuals with the same autoimmune disease may actually be fairly rare because it may be timing, it may be what's happening in that individual at a specific time where the autoimmune process hits the pancreas in one case and may hit the thyroid in another case. So there's a lot of thoughts in terms of complexity of autoimmunity. But from this immunochip data, we also have the questions of actually how much risk can be predicted based on our SNPs. Where are these SNPs and what's their impact? And can we learn something about the function? So we decided at that time, let's just construct some models. Let's look at models of type 1 diabetes risk based on the genetics that we know about. So we just developed some risk score models. One was we identified 27 SNPs in the MHC that captured most of the variation due to HLA. And then there were 46 non-MHC SNPs that captured non-MHC variation. Compared that with 27 HLA SNPs, MHC SNPs, compared that with the 46. We assessed it in 2,300 cases and 2,300 controls as a training set. We then had additional 1,200 cases and 3,500 controls as a test set. And then we decided to look at it in families, too, where we had uh, sort of case control prediction. And, of course, this was sort of our idea of can we actually use this in some way of determining what is the risk based on our genetic information. And so here's the ROC curve. The ROC curve was interesting. If we just took the median risk value and said, if you're higher than that median value, you're at risk and should have type 1 diabetes. If you're lower, then you shouldn't. The area on the curve is about 0.92. Uh, when you look at the sensitivity based on the median, sensitivity is about 0.86. Specificity is 0.81. Does it actually... Uh, give you great positive predictive value? How many of you think that it gives you great positive predictive value? Raise your hand. That's good. No one does. You know, the prevalence is four per thousand. It kills you, right? But, you know, you can get a genetic risk score and figure out if you're at high or not high genetic risk. And this is using the median. So you can think about other thresholds. So one of the questions, do you need more SNPs, better accuracy, you know, other ancestries. Remember, this was actually a primarily Caucasian analysis because at the time we had what we could get and most of what we could get is non-Hispanic whites. It turns out that the uh, type 1 diabetes genetic consortium made a real effort of trying to get non-white cases and controls. We actually tried to get non-white families. Um, that was one of the hardest things we tried and we decided it was difficult to get intact families, and so we just decided, okay, punt, let's go after cases and controls. And so we now have on the order of 3,500 African ancestry cases and however many controls, you know, much more than that, and about 3,000 Hispanic ancestry type 1 cases and a large number of controls. We even have around 1,000 or so uh, Asian ancestry cases and controls. So you can think about how, one that, how, that, how those samples can be used as well. So what about this type 1 risk in low prevalence populations? You know, we collected all those cases and controls. Uh, one of the things about the type 1 diabetes genetics consortium was we split the world into four networks. And each network had a PI, and each PI contacted collection groups and hospitals and so forth. Uh, so there was the North America network. Yeah, it's easy, you know. We have people in North America. Denver's in North America, so you know it's it's great. Easy to collect cases and controls and families. Uh, 
we had an Asia Pacific network. It was centered in Melbourne, Australia. So if you want to have a nice meeting in the winter time, you go to Melbourne, Australia. Um, and they started in Australia, New Zealand, but also covered Singapore, Malaysia, and other areas, Thailand, so forth. We tried to get in Japan, but that didn't work out. Uh, we actually had a very good chance of getting Chinese, but at the end of the day, Chinese government, which at that time was maybe six men over the age of 85, said no, because it's not an important disease in China, so you know, sorry. Um, we did get India, but uh, a lot of, of uh, about 1,200 cases of, uh, or SIP pair families from Asia Pacific. We also had European network, and we had the UK network. Um, UK as a continent, I guess, but also for political reasons. Uh, and I won't say more about that. Uh, African ancestry chromosomes, of course, have smaller haplotype blocks and hopefully help us in, in resolution. A low prevalence, smaller sample size, though, reduced power. Are there same or different loci uh, that we see in Caucasians, or are the same or different SNPs within a locus? And so this is CTLA-4. It's a known type 1 diabetes locus. The most associated SNP in European ancestry, if you look at African populations, is down here in terms of significance. The most associated SNP in African populations in CTLA-4 is different. Not that different if you think about the distance, but it is actually quite different. And it's not just the little frequency differences either. If you look at uh, renolase, another type 1 diabetes uh, recognized locus, in terms of the risk for type 1 diabetes, uh, renolase is a, a, a locus or a gene that has very little information about it. It's more related to kidney in some ways. But in Caucasian populations, the most significant SNP is buried down here in these African ancestry populations. African ancestry populations have this as the most associated SNP. So it's in a totally different part of the gene. It may have something to do, you know, we can think about what are the reasons for that. It may have something to do with the way the structure of the, the chromatin is arranged and chromatin contact, but you don't know. It certainly is clear that it's a significantly different gene or SNP in the same gene. So is that heterogeneity or is it something else? And then one of the hardest regions in the genome for us is this part of 17Q12. It's ORMDL3 and GSDMB. And for those of you working in asthma, and I'm looking at Kathleen, know this really well because it's also an asthma locus. And there have been efforts in asthma to try to show you that, oh, there's a promoter polymorphism here that actually accounts for the risk of asthma in this locus. This is a hell of a locus. I mean, it has all these genes. It has, you know, we've, we've looked at different things. And in fact, the most significant SNP in African ancestry populations is this one, which is more over the ORMDL3 than the GSDMB. In Caucasian populations, it's a totally different SNP. So we're seeing this difference between African ancestry type 1 diabetes sites in the genome, or even within the same locus, or the same gene that differ from Caucasian ancestry. And as that's telling us that what we see in a more, uh, in a less powered study, the truth, or if we had double the sample size, would it actually change? So in some ways, all this wealth of information is giving us potentially hints that we should be looking at a different place, but it's also telling us that maybe you just need to get more sample size to, to get at the information that you need to tell us what's real. So, you know, we, we have this initial result from 25,000 samples, and now we have 65,000 samples with immunochip data. Uh, I have to say that the QC of 65,000 samples took more than three times the amount of time for the QC on the 25,000 samples, in part because um, there's a tendency, I think, for people to have a gene to volunteer in research studies. And people will volunteer in multiple research studies because they're interested in the disease. And then there's the case where 
you have family members willing to volunteer in multiple research studies. So in your 25,000 samples, there'll be a number of people who will have offspring or siblings or parents who are in the 65,000 who weren't in the 25,000. And suddenly you have to figure out who's related to whom. And there are people who have been in three different studies. You know, we've seen them twice in the first 25,000. We've seen them a third time in a different set. It's not quite the same as, you know, people in Finland also appear in a Swedish study, you know, but we've seen that too. So there's a part of Finland that's not that far from Sweden. Probably it's cold enough, it forms ice, and they just walk across and participate. <laughs> Never know. So what, what actually happens when we increase the sample size a lot? So this is the, the general plot of 65,000 samples from the meta-analysis. And you know this p-value basically is 10 to the minus 80th up here at the top. <clears throat> so you know days of p 10 to the minus 10th, just forget that. Uh, of course, HLA keeps going. And it, it, it's at this point well beyond, uh, you know, I think even before it was like 10 to the minus 1,000th. Here it's, you know, it's 10 to the minus ridiculous. Uh, here's insulin, which also kept going away. There's PTPN22 and so forth. So you basically have replicated what we'd seen before, but are there new things? And there's actually seven potentially novel type 1 diabetes loci from the initial work on the, on the meta-analysis. And like anything, it, it, some of these may make sense because you, you know, given enough alcohol, you can think of reasons why this is a good candidate gene for type 1 diabetes. But sometimes not enough alcohol can help you think about why something is a good candidate gene. So one of these is MMEL1. It's associated with uh, PBG, PBC, which is one of the autoimmune diseases that we've seen in, the, in our consortium. Uh, there's an overlap with some of the sites with type 1 diabetes already. So it's uh, involved in degrading small peptides. Uh, TRB2, you know, triples has a, a family of genes, and one of those is associated with type 2 diabetes, but it's also associated with uveitis and narcolepsy, which are autoimmune diseases. Uh, PRKRA is a protein activator of interferon, induced protein kinase, uh, so it mediates the effects of an interferon or response to viral infection. That sounds pretty good as well. Uh, KLF3, the cripple-like factors, there's tons of those in the genome. A lot of them involved in cardiovascular disease. It's a transcription factor paralog of KLF12, which represses AP2-alpha uh, transcription factor. Hard to make sense of those. Uh, others, local uh, centromere genes. You know, what does a centromere have to do with this? Uh, well, maybe it has something other than dealing with centromeres. Uh, this one is a signal transduction activity and transcription coactivator. Uh, it's also replication of parvi paraviruses, so you think it's a possible trigger for type 1 diabetes. Uh, this one forms a complex with tubulins, and this one is related to uh, melanoma. So, you know, some of these make sense, some of them don't. But again, it's, it's the first initial result of something that's new. Uh, and this is being done by my graduate student, Cassie Robertson, and John Todd's grad student, Jamie Inshaw both of whom would be great to recruit uh, as postdocs, by the way. Uh, so I would let you suggest that. Cassie actually has a master's in math from NC State and a, no, a, a bachelor's in math at NC State, master's in biostatistics from Michigan, working with Mike Finke and Gonzalo Bacasis. So, you know, really good uh, computationally in lab work. So these are potentially novel type 1 loci by tripling the sample size, basically. Um, what about whole genome sequencing? We've heard a lot about whole genome sequencing. Uh, I think I've talked to most of the people here at some point about TopMed, Transomics for Precision Medicine. But I'm also involved in the Centers for Common Disease Genomics uh, with whole genome sequencing conducted at WashU in St. Louis uh, and initial focus on minority populations. So we've sent them about 3,000 samples for whole genome sequencing in type 1 cases controls. And so we have some preliminary results there, too. Uh, here's uh, one, RFTN1, chromosome 3. Uh, P-value is 10 to the minus 9th. Uh, beta cell antigen receptor signaling. So that, that looks good. And then this 
NRP1, TGB1 region, uh, which we don't know a whole lot about that at this stage. Uh, it, it's, again, reasonable p-value, six times to the minus eight. Uh, it's possibly involved. I mean, most of the other SNPs we've identified tend to be in energenic regions, again, consistent with sort of a DNA regulatory effect. But you think, okay, well, whole genome sequencing is like giving you whole genome, three billion base pairs. But again, it's a fairly small sample size, 3,000 uh, samples, which about half cases, half controls. So I think we'll have to, to do some more fine tuning on that. So how does one identify uh, functionally important variants for type 1 diabetes? And of course, you see here the, the wolf in sheep's clothing. I think the, it's hard to figure out what actually these variants do. There's also another wolf back here if you you know, really think there might be two functional variants and that affect disease. So a lot of this, what we've we started doing is uh, looking at uh, gene expression as a first step. And of course, gene expression, you can think of as a quantitative trait. And you look at uh, essentially the, the expression either through arrays or what we typically do is RNA sequencing. And you have a SNP and you use the the expression profile as the, as the outcome, and you can determine what the EQTL is. And so when you start thinking about type 1 diabetes, you think about the complexity of the different tissue types. So I already told you that type 1 diabetes has its list of credible SNPs and T cells and B cells. So if you think, well, you should get the same thing, well, it doesn't work that way. Now, we've looked at cis EQTLs, where it's actually close to the SNP, or trans EQTLs. But if you just focus on the EQTLs, it turns out that majority of the cis EQTLs certainly are, are cell type specific. Now, the, the uh, GTEx project has, has made some recent uh, publications about the number of, of essentially tissue types, whether a single or multiple with the cis EQTLs. And it's also clear that, you know, it's a very complicated system. Uh, the shared EQTLs, which are the ones in this sort of pentagon, are, tend to mirror developmental or functional relationships of cell types. And that some of the shared EQTLs differ in direction of effect by cell type. So you can think that, okay, you see a risk allele having an effect in T cells, and you look at B cells, and it actually has a different direction of effect. Now, what's true, and, and how do you try to, to cope with that? So if we go back to this chromosome 17Q12 region, uh, there's a significant SNP right up in here. And so what do you look at in terms of the EQTL effects at that specific SNP? So we decided to take on a little pilot project of about, I think there were like 48 uh, cases and 48 controls and looking at the RNA sequencing in different cell types. Uh, so we have B cells. So these are the CD19 positive B cells, CD4, T cells, and then uh, these are natural killer cells. And we have you know, different SNPs uh, related to that. And so you can see going from B cell to CD4 and, and then natural killer cells, for this SNP, it actually looks like very consistent for this SNP, you see similarities. In this SNP, for the genotypes, the expression goes down. Here, stays the same, stays the same. So you're starting to look at differences between the SNP effects and the cell types for a given SNP. And these are all SNPs that are highly associated in NLD for type 1 diabetes. So, you know, if you think that there are specific cell types that are important for type 1 diabetes, how can you utilize the SNP information with the cell type information? And do you really want to look at T cells versus B cells or natural killer cells or other types of cells? I think as we go through in human genetics, that's one of the major questions we have is how do we utilize the gene expression data with different cell types when you think you know what the cell type is? So if we then go a bit differently direction, but still gene regulation, 
one of the approaches we're using is a tax seek. And so this is open chromatin, and it has to have transpose accessibility, transpose says accessible open chromatin, so you could have binding of transcription factors. And so one of the things we can do is see, look at transcription, transcription factor binding motifs across these regions where we have uh, credible SNPs for risk of type 1 diabetes. And so we just looked at a series of different cell types, CD20s, CD34, CD4, CD8, CD19, so T cells and B cells, basically. And you can see specific peaks on the TAC-seq showing that these are essentially levels of transcription factor binding. And so you can see that this actually lines up quite nicely. Here's another set here, and this is a specific gene, ACAC1. Now, what does it mean to have a SNP affect transcriptor factor binding? You know, this is not a zero one type of trait. This actually can, is a quantitative measure of binding. So a SNP that is important for type one diabetes may decrease the binding by 20%. And is that within error of what you're seeing here? Or it may decrease it by 50% which may have a big effect. Now, one of the things that a uh, number of projects has shown is that you don't actually have to have a SNP in the transcription factor binding site to have an effect. It can be outside of that site. So we're having to think about how we have our credible SNP list and how the SNPs may affect transcription factor binding. So one of the nice things about having genetic data is that we have genetic data on all of these tens of thousands of samples where we also have PBMCs and we have uh, essentially opportunity to sort into the different cell types, look at transcription factor binding through a tax seq look at gene expression through RNA-seq, and then evaluate those individuals with the different genotypes at that specific site. So, process of identification of these causal SNPs becomes pretty complicated. Uh, from the fine mapping, we have a 99% credible SNP list. And that 99% credible SNP list, then, is about 1,300 SNPs. You know, there's, you know, trivially, there's the most associated SNP in each of these 40 or 50 regions. But there's a lot of SNPs that could be the most important SNP in that region. Uh, what, so what we do is we define within these relevant tissues the DNA ATAC-seq regulatory regions. We identify the residues that are most critically important. We then define the most important EQTL from RNA-seq in the same tissues. And then we construct uh, de novo transcription factor networks. Now, if we think we have a specific site that's most important, we can do CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to change that SNP and then repeat the RNA-seq and the ATAC-seq to see if it actually makes a change. So this is an example. Um, and again, sort of novel information that we haven't really generated much of. But here is the effective ATAC-seq peaks. Um, and you, there's a broad peak here. And you can see the, the ATAC-seq sequence underneath. And so there's... Uh, the bindings are here uh, at this specific SNP, you can't really see very well, unfortunately. So the top uh, row is ATAG, the bottom is ATGG. So that's the critical SNP there, the change in, in base pair. Here is what it shows on the immunochip. It's one of the most associated SNPs. And if you do RNA-seq, you can see that there is a change by genotype. So this suggests that this specific site is actually important. If you take another region of the genome, here is the immunochip SNP that's most important. You look at the attack seq peak, and the SNP is right here. It's a G to a T, and that has a different transcription factor binding profile. And you look at the change in the RNA seq, and it's still consistent on the non strong. And so, from this type of work, we sort of summarized that we can make progress in our work towards understanding the genetic basis of type 1 diabetes by knowing the variants 
that account for about 90% of the genetic risk. We can think about what the functional aspect is through RNA-seq and other transcriptomics, but we also need to take a look at other regulatory aspects by looking at the open chromatin and transcriptin factor binding networks. And eventually we have to then think about how we can validate what we think are the appropriate SNPs by performing the experiments of changing the genotype in our cell lines that make what we think would be a change in the gene regulation network. So, you know, in summary, what have we done? Uh, actually, we haven't done a whole lot because we still haven't cured type 1 diabetes. Uh, we have identified who are the individuals who are at high genetic risk, and from that, we can think about looking at functional basis in these immune-relevant cell types. Uh, the genetic signatures appear to cluster, but it is actually uncertain whether this commonality implies the same variants in the same tissues at the same time. Now, I didn't present something here, but we've also worked with Peter Gregerson, at, uh, who's involved in rheumatoid arthritis at North Shore, Long Island Jewish, and we decide, okay, what can we do to try to figure out if a, ver of a, if a region of the genome is important for type 1 diabetes, and that same region of the genome is important in rheumatoid arthritis, are the genetic variants lining up? So sort of simplistically, we said, well, let's just sequence in, in this region and see what happens. Uh, the next thing we did was say, Let's not do one region. Let's do like, I don't know, 50 regions. And well, how many people? Like 20 or 30? Oh, yeah. So we did 180 trios. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, two parents and an affected individual with type 1 diabetes from a SID pair family that had another affected and one unaffected. And because we have an idea what the genetics is, we can impute. The, the sequence and, and, and everything is in these people. And so Peter just said, oh, I'll just do 500 cases and I'll get some controls. And so what happened was you sequence across a region that has a SNP associated with type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, the same SNP, and when you sequence, you find that the SNP that's most associated with type 1 is here, the SNP that's associated with group enteral arthritis is here. Okay, so what does that tell us? It's probably the region is important, but maybe not the SNP. And if you look at some of the work that's ongoing now with GTEx, and specifically with the, the capture C work and chromatin uh, confirmation, you'll see that there's a lot of DNA is like spaghetti that's cooked. It's not like spaghetti that uncooked and is a straight line. Cooked spaghetti goes all over the place. And the DNA circles around and contacts in different ways. So it could be that one contact is in one part of the genome and causes risk for type 1 diabetes. And yet, in a different context of different tissue, it could be in a different part of that same region but a different spot and cause risk of, of rheumatoid arthritis. And we found that in almost every site we looked at. So we hardly, now to be honest, there might be some SNPs that are common when you look at it, but there's always differences between type one and rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a type of genetic complexity that we're dealing with in terms of autoimmune disease, and I think also in terms of any complex human disease. It's, the idea that there's a locus and there's a single SNP and it may be coding is probably fallacious. And it can be multiple SNPs that affect multiple tissues. So that's, a, that's a, another main issue. And then we really have started to explore these regulatory actions of type 1 diabetes-associated variants using human samples, cell types, and analyses and transcription factor networks. This takes a number of people. Um, so this is... Probably, I think, most of the key people involved in what I've presented so far. Uh, University of Virginia, we have uh, Suna Onagakamusku, who has worked a lot in terms of the, of the genotyping and sequencing. Wei Min Chin has been uh, 
primary involved in analyses. Cassie Robertson is a graduate student. Mike Gurton is uh, expert in attack seek. Uh, Mazar Adley has been working in CRISPR Cas9. Akrash Ratan has been involved in DNA sequencing. Uh, Pat Concannon is an old colleague of, of ours. He's, not, he's younger than I am. So he's a colleague who's been with us a long time. Uh, and that still doesn't work out. At any rate, Pat Concannon <laughs> is, is an important person in our, our project and now at University of Florida, director of their Genomics Institute. Uh, Aaron Quinlan at University of Utah has, has been a collaborator on some of our work. And in Cambridge, Oxford, uh, John was in Cambridge and now at Oxford, and a group of people and, and been working with us in that group for a long time. And uh, Shoma Rashaudri, uh, Harmjohn Westra, and Jin Lee Hugh has worked at the Broad and at uh, Brigham and Women's. Uh, we've been supported uh, handsomely in some ways by NIDDK, JDRF, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions. Thoughts, questions? Are we on the right track? I have a question about your skills. Mm -hmm. um, so, there in the R the R C group, the sensory specificity sensitivity is about as high as I've seen. Mm -hmm. Yet it's not it's got a very high predictive value because of the low prevalence. Yeah. So I guess two questions. One is there a subset of individuals where I imagine your distributions are not overlapping if you look at the distribution of risk. So there's a subset of individuals that are just extreme at risk. I mean, it may not be predicted for everybody, but is there a subset that it's just clearly? Would... Yeah. You know, the if you look at the risk scores, part of it is also driven, of course there's a large number of HLA SNPs, yeah. or SNPs in the region that are capturing HLA. And if you think about HLA and type 1 diabetes, you know, the HLA effects for risk are maybe on the order of 50% in the population, and those in the controls would have maybe a 30%. Um, and so that has an effect on the risk scores. If you look at the other components of that, which are the non-MHC SNPs, there are some hints that those more autoimmune things are at an extreme of higher risk, but you know it's hard to tease a lot of that out. My other question, uh, maybe not well thought out, but I think maybe you have families, so I'm curious. families and cases and controls. Yeah. Right. So I'm curious. You know, there's a relatively low predictive value in the general population, mm -hmm. but if you condition on have family history. Because that would be one of the first risk factors someone comes in because I have a sibling that has what is my risk? Yeah, and in type 1 diabetes, 90% or more of the cases with type 1 diabetes has no family history. Right, but within that. And, but within the subset of, of our affected SIB pair families, right, we actually look, look specifically at the performance of the risk score, yeah. and it's not very good. Oh. In part because the HLA region accounts for so much of the risk in affected SIB pair families that. You know, if you look at sharing between two individuals with type 1 diabetes, right. at HLA alone, 55% share two alleles, 40% share one, and 5% share none. Yeah, and I suspect some of that also with your estrogen because there are two affected per family. So right. It's already, it's already loaded. loaded. Yeah. Chris, did you have a family uh, question? <laughs> you have a family. Um, actually, uh, in, in regards to the fine mapping uh, where you're taking Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't you sort of expect when you look at the diseases separately that you're going to come up with different top hits? Because our ability to find map is not even all that great um, when just looking at LD patterns. Yeah, so I guess the, the prior hypothesis was since the same SNP seemed to be implicated in RA and type 1, and sort of a genome level, gross level, then if you find map, you might find different SNPs associated than the original, but you still might see the same one. And that may have been a naive assumption, but it certainly was apparent that you saw evidence of some effect at one part of the locus that was consistent, but then you saw a significant secondary effect somewhere else. Uh, 
that diff was different between type 1 and RA. So it's hard to determine whether that consistent SNP was really the primary causal SNP, although I hate to use the word causal, um, or whether there's some variant that increases risk of autoimmunity regardless of what it may be, and there's maybe a tissue-specific effect somewhere else in that locus. That's, that's one interpretation. Um, so when you were doing that mapping, were those, those were all individuals who were, I'm thinking you have a probably small number of families where you have both T1D and... Oh, no. These, and what happens there? So uh, we haven't looked at specific uh, families where there was both occurring. I remember that Tim Behrens and Peter Gregerson recruited a set of about 180 to 200 families with multiple autoimmune diseases. Um, and that was probably 15 years ago. <laughs> uh, those would be good families to try to look and sort of try to tease some of that apart. In our days of type 1 diabetes research at University of Minnesota, we had 60 families in which a sibling had type 1, and typically a sister had autoimmune thyroid disease. Uh, there were some other families with type 1 and other autoimmune disease. And there were 60 families, which is why I remember it, uh, 60 families also where the proband or had type 1 and later developed autoimmune thyroid disease. And so we tried to sort that out through sequencing HLA class 1 and class 2 genes, and you couldn't really see very much. <laughs> you know, it was, they all, they typically all were HLA DR3-4, and, you know, it was couldn't really tease much apart with 60 individuals. Yes? Uh, my question is, um, in all your, in your work, do you have any uh, access, or you give us access to a list of just like, annotated genes from your work with the Diabetes Consortium? Because then, as you know, looking at each individual SNP is, takes a long time. So <laughs> this is you've already done. Is, yeah, so the, uh, the paper in 2015 in Nature Genetics by Suna Onagamuscu, who is the first author, uh, has an appendix or a summary uh, supplemental material that not only lists all the credible SNPs, but all the, the annotated genes that are there. And, you know, our next paper, which will be with uh, mega analysis, will have similar types of things. It's a paper we're putting together, I've, I've put together on the uh, African American analyses. Hopefully, that will have additional material as well. There's an interesting Af African specific HLA type uh, that seems to provide risk. And Janelle Noble has published on that previously, and we've done the sequencing and so forth. Yeah, it's there as well. Um, but yeah, it's a, you know, type 1 diabetes in many ways is an. I wouldn't say a paradigm of a complex human disease, uh, but if you compare it to other complex human diseases, uh, we know pretty much, I would say, you know, in all modesty, we know a large amount of the genetic variation attributed to uh, risk of type 1 diabetes, whereas for other complex phenotypes, 10% to 20% might be a reasonable estimate of how much the genetic variation that they've accounted for. So in many ways, HLA being about half the genetic risk is by and large a, a benefit for us, even though it's a curse figuring out what HLA does. But we've then found the additional component in the non-MHC. So I think type 1 diabetes is very different from other complex diseases in that way. And that means that we could even think about screening populations for genetic risk. And that's what we'll talk about tomorrow. And the symposium that, that the Barbara Davis Center is, is sponsoring. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.